thank you all for coming. I'm Don Wilcox, and I'm a member of the CCSE group, and I'm here to talk to you about supernova simulations and what's going on um, in our group for that I'm working on for supernova. Um, before, before I really get into simulations and, and the physics involved, I want to briefly describe what type 1a supernova are just for some general background. I'm focusing in the first part of this talk on type 1a supernova, and those are brilliant explosions um, where if you look at the top left of this slide, you, could, you see supernova 1994d along with its host galaxy, and the supernova is the bright white spot in the lower left of that image. During the peak luminosity of a type 1a supernova, the luminosity rivals that of the entire host galaxy that it's in, so these are really bright. You can see them from very far away in distant galaxies, and they're useful for measuring distances to faraway galaxies. Um, luminosity is powered by the decay of radioactive, radioactive nickel-56 that is produced in nucleosynthesis, um, and they have a, a, their light curves have a standardizable property that allows you to measure the distance to the event. Uh, the big question is, where do they, these come from, and uh, what different physical processes can give you what, these events? They're very rare, about two per century per galaxy, so it's not like we can watch a star in our own galaxy give us a type 1a um, anytime with any regularity. Um, from the observations of these events, they arise from the radioactive uh, decay of nickel-56. This was produced by burning one solar mass of carbon-12 and oxygen-16. Under special conditions, people have proposed several different progenitor scenarios for these. Uh, I'm going to talk about just one of these progenitor scenarios today, and that is a picture that's shown in the lower left where you have a white dwarf that accretes matter from a companion star and raises its mass to the unstable maximum mass for matter supported by electron degeneracy pressure. This star becomes unsta unstable and, and undergoes a, th a thermonuclear runaway. That's the, that's the basic story. I'm going to focus on a part of that story that I haven't talked about yet, but that is the role of electron captures and beta decays in convection leading up to this explosion. Um, and there's some problems with existing methods that people have used to study this aspect in the past. And those problems include you need to be able to simulate very long time scales because convection takes place over uh, many, many hours. And you need lots of convective turnover times to really study this process. I will describe more in detail in a few more slides what this, how this works. Um, but you need to be able to do realistic convection in 3D. Most, most of the time when people do these studies, they use 1D Lagrangian codes for this, um, and they can't really get the physics right. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about work that I've done with Lomach Hydro to do this in 3D with long time scales with realistic reaction networks. Um, and what came out of this is the first 3D simulations of this electron capture and beta decay physics for these 1A progenitors. Um, so before I get into simulations, I, I do want to describe how this works. So on the right-hand side is a cartoon that shows a white dwarf. And this is a white dwarf core. So red indicates regions of, in the core where carbon-12 plus carbon-12 fusion is the dominant energy source. The reactions involved in that are over on the left in the red box these power convection that stirs up the core, and that's highlighted in blue here. Convection carries material around the, through the core, and it'll cross this green shell that I've noted, the Urca shell, and that is a shell where these two reactions in the green box below um, compete with each other. So I'll briefly mention what these reactions are. Sodium-23, is produced by carbon-12 fusion in the core of the star. And at high densities, it captures electrons. So you get sodium-23 nucleus plus an electron gives you a neutrino plus neon-23. And then that neon-23 can be carried by convection 
uh, to lower densities where it will beta decay. And so it will give you the electron back, not the same electron, um, plus an anti-electron neutrino plus so sodium-23 again. And this can form a cycle with convection, stirring this material across, back and forth across this green shell many times. Um, this process is an energy transport process in the star, and it's a heating process. And so this, this slide explains where the energy for this heating process comes from. It comes from the pool of degenerate electrons in the star. Um, so if you look at the, at the right-hand plot here, you're looking at a schematic for beta decays and for electron captures uh, that occur at, say, a point in the star. If, you, if we just look at the magenta colors here, magenta and black and ignore green, what we're looking at is the picture of electron captures. The schematic plot in the lower part of this plot is, is a Fermi-Dirac distribution that the electrons come from. They're very degenerate, and so they fill this distribution up to a Fermi energy. When you pull an electron out of this with an electron capture reaction, you're pulling out a high energy electron from this tail. And when that, and so you make a neon 23 nucleus. Now, the story is convection will take this neon 23 nucleus to, out to low densities in the star because you've got convection moving material out from the core. When you get to low densities, then green and black happen. So if you look at just green and black, you're looking at the picture for beta decay back from neon 23 to sodium 23. And you're putting an electron back into the degenerate matter in the star. And that fills an electron Fermi-Dirac distribution, but corresponding to a much lower Fermi energy at low density. And this energy difference is released in, in the star um, as neutrinos and as heating. So there are two things that result from this. You lose energy from the star. Neutrinos just stream out of the star. It's, it's a low enough density that neutrinos don't interact. And you're heating material at low densities. Um, so with that, you need to be able to couple this to convection in order to get the whole story correct. And so um, what I'm using to do this is Lomach hydrodynamics with Maestro X. And um, there's the main equations for Maestro X on the left the, for the momentum and enthalpy and species transport equations that are solved, as well as the velocity divergence constraint for the, the Lomach system. The main reason that this approach is useful is that it allows much longer time, time steps than would be possible with a compressible code. So I can take 0.2 second time steps with this, that, whereas the compressible time step would be less than 0.1 milliseconds. Um, and this is, these are the simulations that come out of including the, these weak nuclear reaction physics together with the low Mach uh, approach. So on the left, you're looking at radial velocity in the star. Blue is, out, is outflows, it's positive radial velocity. The center of the star is in the center of this image. And red is inflows, it's negative radial velocity. And so the picture on the left shows that convection is transporting material into and out of the core of the star and throughout a convective uh, spherical region centered on the center of the star. Um, and at the top of the convection zone, at around 600 kilometers in radius on this plot, the very edge, Convection gives rise to gravity waves that just kind of slosh around the rest of the star above. But inside this convective zone, the nuclear reactions shown on the right dominate. And so here you're looking at energy generation from nuclear reactions, uh, where the center of the star is burning carbon, so C C12 plus C12, as well as electron captures. And then carbon fusion stops once you get to lower temperatures and lower densities you transition to this magenta shell region where only electron captures onto sodium-23 uh, are operating. And then that transitions to an outer green annulus. And that's where beta decays. You switch these ERCA reactions from electron captures to beta decays. So when you electron capture, you're storing energy from the electrons into nuclei, binding energies. Convection carries 
that neon-23 nucleus created from electron capture out to low densities, it beta decays back um, and releases energy. And that's why you get positive energy generation out there. And you notice that the shape of convection is imprinted on this energy generation uh, sort of volume. Um, you can see like ripples and eddies in, in the energy generation from convection. Um, so that was, this was, this is all about systematics that I'm studying for type 1a supernova with low Mach hydro. Um, I did a lot of work developing reaction networks for this, and those have found applications in, in many other places. So I'm going to switch to talk about that. Um, one of the things I did for that project was to automate building reaction networks uh, from reaction rate databases. So before this, there was no general tool for automating this process. You had to look through a reaction rate database, pick out the reactions you wanted, manually code things up. Um, or you had to use large packages that, that didn't give you as much flexibility. Um, so what I worked on for this was to build a, a Python interface that let you specify exactly what nuclei you wanted or what rates you wanted. And it will generate Fortran code for you. Uh, and then later CUDA Fortran code so that you can run all of this on a GPU. Um, networks look like are shown on the right. I'm going to talk about this more later, so I'm not going to spend time right now on it. Um, but this, that, this work is published in the Journal of Open Source Software, if you want to have a look. Um, what, one thing that we need to solve these reaction networks is, is an implicit ODE solver. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate that with this plot. Uh, this, this shows how stiff some of these networks can be. Um, the plot you're looking at on the right is the base 10 log of the absolute values of a Jacobian for a reaction network that is representative of X-ray burst conditions, which I'll talk more about that science in a bit. But the main takeaway here is that the maximum scale here is 30, and things kind of bottom out around minus 30. So there's a 60 order of magnitude dynamic range in this Jacobian, um, which makes the system incredibly stiff to solve. Um, ratio of max to min eigenvalues of this Jacobian is 10 to the 26. Um, and the way to solve this is, well, the, way, the best way that we have found so far to solve this is <laughs> using Vode. And one of the things that I did is ported this from Fortran to CUDA Fortran um, so that we could get this running on GPUs. The main approach for this is, so you're looking at the backward differentiation formula for an implicit ODE solver here. The main approach to this is that, that Vo takes is differentiate this so that you can linearize it and solve this nonlinear equation iteratively using this, the Jacobian of the system that I already showed is very stiff. Um, all of this is done on the GPU with one GPU thread per, per simulation cell. And the integrator is serialized in that GPU thread um, for an NVIDIA P100 GPU and constant initial conditions, this is, turns out to be 10 times faster than an ideal 10-core scaling on a, on a Power 8 CPU. Um, and one of the things that this enables is simulations of X-ray bursts on GPUs. So I'm going to show this science, which is part of a collaboration with the, the Stony Brook group who uses, is using Castro for doing X-ray bursts. You're looking at in this simulation, if it plays, you're looking at flame evolution on the surface of a neutron star that's burning helium on the neutron star surface, and it's burning it all the way up to nickel 56. If this plays, well, all right. So this is in 2D axisymmetry, and this is, a, this is the same network that I showed you is very stiff. Uh, oh, it is playing, OK. I'm not sure why there's a pop up there, but all right, it's playing. So th the bottom plot in this panel shows you velocity. And so you can see that the flame is starting from the left, it's moving to the right, and it's churning up material from, from in front of it and from below. And in front of it, you see yellow here in the second plot from the, the top, that's helium fuel that is being mixed into the flame as it travels to the right. Um, and we can now run this on Summit using the reaction network GPU work that I just described. 
Um, and this is, this is published in, uh, in a paper, in the paper shown here with Kieran Iden. What are the axes you're plotting there? What's the, I don't understand those plots. Yeah, so let me play this again. The vertical axis for all, all four of these plots are for the, exactly the same geometry. They're plotting different quantities. The vertical axis here is, uh, this is cylindrical azimuthal geometry. So, so vertical axis is the z axis and the lateral axis is a radius. And this corresponds to, um, if I can write on the wall, here's a neutron star. This is the simulation geometry where the flame starts at a pole and we're looking at a very small section of the neutron star right around the pole where our lateral axis is away from the pole and the vertical axis is up uh, from the star. And so this is, this is to simulate flame evolution for one model of how X-ray bursts start, where in this model, an X-ray burst will start at the, at the pole and then burn across the surface um, to eventually consume the entire surface of the, of the neutron star. Um. So I mentioned that this work was published with, with Kieran Iden and, and the rest of the Stony Brook group. Um, last summer, I had the, the chance to work with Kieran on network development for larger networks for studying hydrogen and, and helium burning on the surface of neutron stars for these simulations. Um, and you're looking at a much larger network here that includes the rapid proton capture process onto nuclei. And the way this works, so the vertical axis for all these plots is number of protons. The, hor the horizontal axis is number of neutrons for all these the species in the network. And protons get rapidly captured by lighter nuclei that move your composition up this, up this chart of the nucleides to heavier elements. And this is thought to be responsible for hydrogen and helium burning on the surfaces of neutron stars, which is something that we can't address with a much smaller network. Um, so all of the GPU work that I've described and reaction networks will also be useful for core collapse supernova. And so I'm going to, this is work in progress, so I'm very briefly going to discuss this. Um, this is part of the, the Exastar project um, that I'm a part of. The basic picture for core collapse supernova is shown on the left-hand side where a massive star collapses. The iron core forms a proto-neutron star. And as the rest of the material falls on top of it, it rebounds off the very stiff neutron star surface and launches a shock wave outward. One of the big simulation challenges is capturing the neutrino radiation hydrodynamics involved in order to really understand how the shock breaks out of the, of the star and ejects out into space. Um, this is very challenging to simulate. Um, so one of, the thing, one of the projects that I was able to participate in with Exastar is coupling Castro to a two-moment radiation transfer uh, code for neutrinos called Thornado, which is developed at uh, Oak Ridge. And, um, and so one of our collaborators, Philip Mosta, uh, ran this test case, which is a a sphere emitting neutrino radiation uh, as a validation test of the code. Um, the movie that I'm playing now is a pure hydro and EOS simulation that I've been running for a, the collapse of a 16 solar mass star as a, just to test how well um, the hydrodynamic solver in Castro and the nuclear equation of state can handle this. Um, so you can see that the star kind of shrinks down to the center and some of the outer edges blow, start blowing away. The next step for that is to, is to run that with the radiation transport on, but it's a, it's a first step. Um, so, I'll, so in conclusion, to review, um, I started out trying to determine how electron captures and beta decays influence progenitors for type 1a supernova. And along the way, developed a lot of tools for reaction networks and um, GPU acceleration that is useful for lots of other problems um, like X-ray bursts and like uh, core collapse supernova. And this is ongoing work that um, I'm excited to share. Thanks for, for listening. I would like to finally thank all the collaborators involved in these projects. There are a lot of names here. I hopefully have not left anyone off, but um, there's lots of people involved here at the lab. 
at Stony Brook University, UC Berkeley, Oak Ridge. Um, Philip Musta, who I mentioned, is now in Amsterdam. Um, and some other folks who are involved with um, either the networks or IRCA, Josiah Schwab and Dean Townsley, as well as uh, Max Katz, who many of you know at NVIDIA, uh, was an invaluable source of conversations. So um, thanks very much. Any questions? In the, uh, in the earlier example there, is the, is the uh, sodium neon cycle the only thing that's going on in those reactions, or are there other reactions going on as well as part of that? There are. Um, the sodium neon cycle is the only component of what I've called the IRCA process. Well, I have, I have referred to it as the IRCA process in this talk, but that name is not unique to me. It was called the IRCA process a long time ago. Um, by George Gamow, who was a physicist at, and he was at a casino, the Casino de Urca, and he made the observation that energy is leaving the core of the star as fast as money is disappearing from the tables. And so that's, energy leaves via these neutrinos. Yeah. Um, the electrons get cycled through this, or just uh, remain part of the star. The nuclei get cycled through the star. Um, and then material gets heated, but you can't get back these, this energy to neutrinos. And that's, that energy is about an MeV per neutrino. Um, so this is the, the IRCA cycle. This is the carbon fusion that powers the convection. Um, and those are the reactions that I'm modeling. Yes. Yeah. Yes. When you have big networks, what fraction of the, of the time goes into evolving the that's a that's a good question uh, for this. So this is a pretty small network, and this the reaction time for this was comparable to the hydro. It was I mean it wasn't longer. I think it was actually a bit shorter. Um, for the larger networks like um, let me see which plot this is. This network we haven't actually run together with hydro yet just because this takes a long time to run, even if you call it on its own, just to do reactions. So before we get this into a fluid simulation, our plan is to cut this down by reducing the number of nuclei on this plot. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so if, you, if you did a, a big core collapse, and you said, I want to do the R process, but I want to do a good job on radiation, would they just both kill you? Or is ra radiation, is radiation still worse? I don't know offhand. Um, I, well, I suspect that both will be extreme. Both of those will be much more expensive than hydrodynamics. Um, but we won't know until we try it, I think. And we haven't done that yet with Castro and Tornado and reactions for core collapse. Um, if so this is work that, like, I just fixed a bug last night that got this to work. <laughs> so <laughs> that's in the future for this project, um, it, people in Exastar permitting. So um. do, we have, like, do you have any observational data? Some data that was observed to kind of use as a benchmark for this Oh, that's a good question. Um, the short answer is not really. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> so the short so I've talked to like one of the Ice Cube project folks, and they were actually disappointed when I told them what the energy for neutrinos is coming out of this IRCA process. It's about an MeV per neutrino, but that's way lower than the energies that they look for. Um, so you wouldn't be able to observe these in a detector like IceCube. Um, the only way you can get observations of this is by looking at spectra and light curves from supernova. Um, and it's possible that if you blew up one of these progenitors with, that was prepared with this IRCA process, which determines how it determines the, the composition structure on the in, in the interior of the star um, because the how electron rich different parts of the star are depend on how active these reactions are 
And so that may, that may have some signatures in, the, in simulated supernova light curves. But that's, an, that's a question for future work. So follow up on this. Are we confident that the arc process happens, or is that, a, is that still in the range of that's the best guess at this point? The ERCA process, I think we're confident that ERCA, the ERCA process happens for Chandrasekhar mass single degenerate scenario for type 1a supernova, where you have one white dwarf accreting from, from a companion up to the Chandrasekhar mass. And then it, and then it undergoes thermonuclear runaway from the core. Um, that, that will have the ERCA process. And that has been, that has, People have been in agreement in the stellar evolution community about this for like 50 or 60 years now. What people have been arguing about in the community is how exactly the ERCA process interacts with convection because people have thought at some points in history that it could actually limit the size of the convective zone that you get. What I was able to show with, in 3D is that doing accurate convection and not 1D like diffusive approximations is that convection goes right through this ERCA shell and so you do actually get a cycle involving nuclei. Um, this was suspected in some 1D Lagrangian models but they can't actually do convection so yeah. A kind of parallel between the difference between compressible and incompressible in like classical CFD but what do you get rid of when you switch from Castro to Maestro, and how much energy transported within like some pressure wave are what you get rid of? Like, to increase your time step, but what, what do you lose when you do that? Do you lose something that is probably not essential here? But you lose the ability, yeah, you lose the ability to capture like the effects of large pressure waves on, on your solution, but that's not important here. No because the star is still in hydrostatic equilibrium on macro scales. And so over the course of these simulations, it doesn't, that is to say, over the course of these simulations, the star isn't heating up quickly enough to expand significantly. Um, it's mostly a steady state convection problem. And so the, what Maestro does, that Castro does not do, what Maestro does is it constructs a hydrostatic base state and then says that the pressure is the base state pressure plus a dynamic pressure in 3D. And so because of that, you have to stay pretty close to hydrostatic in order to really, in these models, in order to, for that to be, to give you accurate results, unless you choose to evolve the base state. But that's not important for this mo these models. Um, yeah. Does that sort of answer the question? Kind of, because you showed at some point like velocity plus. Yeah. And they are huge. Yeah, the velocities are large, but the sound speed is also super it's large. Huge, okay. The sound speed is a, approximately the speed of light. It's a, a bit less than that, but it's on that same order of magnitude because it's, sound is transmitted in these stars through the degenerate electrons. Um, and so the really huge velocities that I showed are still four orders of magnitude below the sound speed. Um, and there really isn't like any large pressure shocks or anything like that. Can I comment? Oh, the, please. What, what happens is the way this is different than other used to is the equation of state, there's the baryonic matter acts like an ideal gas, but there's a degenerate Fermi electron gas and there's a radiation pressure that are all rolled into the equation of state. So it's a really non ideal guy. Okay. So that's, that's how it's different. Okay, how the sound of speed just goes. The sound of speed goes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right. Thank you.